Welcome to our daily hobbies. I'm Economicon, and today we're going to play through the demo for Art Without Blood. Where we play as an art university student who goes to visit an art gallery only to witness a woman's murder. Behind every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. What is my name? Of course, everyone must know my name by now. It is my name is the Meek. My name is Meek. I don't go to art galleries as much as I should. It's one thing to see a piece of art on the screen or in a book. But when you go in person, it's as if you can feel the textures of marble and acrylic and oil with your eyes. I never found a time to go when the weather was nice enough to motivate me to leave the house. But when the day was just cold enough to drink hot chocolate, but not quite frigid enough to bring out winter coats, I finally went out. The joy of going to an art gallery alone is that no one is pushing you to go to a certain place. I can stand and look at any piece of art you want for as long as I desire. And the atmosphere, it clears your head. Everyone is quiet to be respectful of others' time, examining works of beauty. I choose a spot in a dimmer room with smaller paintings hanging all around. Other benches were crowded, but mine was empty. All there was to do was bask in the atmosphere. There were small groups making minimal conversation that were too middle to eavesdrop on. My legs hurt. I eyed a bench facing some paintings nearby. There were never empty seats. I ran to the spot as much as one could run in an art gallery. Weaving a sigh of relief, I brushed myself off and walked at the bones of my wrists. I looked to my sides. To my left was a couple standing next to the bench, looking from their phones to pieces scattered on the walls, pointing at the smaller ones. To my right, was another person, alone. They were fixated on the painting in front of us, expression pensive, making themselves comfortable, crossing their legs with their right hand in front of their lips, their left hand supporting their elbow underneath. Whatever they were wearing didn't seem typical for a patron of the gallery. What do you think of it? They were still observing the painting, only tilting their heads slightly in my direction. Did they notice I was looking? I pretended not to hear them and look away. Are you truly someone who is more interested in the people at the gallery than the art on the walls? I wasn't staring. Yes, you were. I don't mind. This is the bark button. Pressing it will have you, your MC, make a snide. Right, using the bark button will give you more information. Wait. But some situations, it could kill you. If you would be so kind, would you answer my question, Bark? What are you, self-absorbed? I don't have to talk to you. I'm not self-absorbed. At least, not to a detrimental point. What do you think of it? I looked in front of us. The Storm by Pierre Auguste Cotte is a piece with theorised origins of movement and love and bursts of light in the darkness that bounced off every surface of fabric and flesh. There isn't a lot known about Cotte's personal life, focused mostly on portraits, even though his most recognisable pieces today are of figures in embrace. Died at 46, married a sculptor's daughter. Do you see the love in this piece? Well, I mean, maybe from him, but I don't know. She doesn't exactly scream love. I'm not sure. Who knows? I'm just here to observe art and people. I don't have to know everything there is to know about peace, an artist, and how to interpret it. And that's all right. Art is for everyone, just as long as you can observe it and form your own opinion. I like this one. But it's not my favourite by Cot. What's your favourite then? Ophelia. Or pause for thought. It pictures the tragic figure from Shakespeare's play in a white dress with blue sleeves and accents. 
her fingers pinched between a page, halfway through flipping it. But instead of watching the book in front of her, she looks up from her novel with an expression that bees almost of knowing. We know her fate, to die with her skin turning blue in the river's clean waters, over heartbreak. Does she know? Does she care? It's beautiful, the way she stares daggers into us to pry our thoughts open. But who am I to ramble on like you care? They brushed some hair out of their face and smiled. My name is Aaron. It's a pleasure to meet you, love. Meek. Meek. I like that. You don't mind if I accompany you, do you? Part of me wanted to resist. They were only a stranger. But with another look, their eyes softened, with their eyebrows knitted and their hands folded in their lap. Sure, you can. The words came out of my mouth as if they were pulled by a string, by hands that were not my own. Aaron stood up and clapped their hands, leaning to one side with grace. Wonderful, really it is. Are we done looking at this one, dear? I looked over the storm once more, at the cracks in the paint from age and exposure, at the reflection of light on the strokes, at the figures and whatever their motivations were. I believe I'm done, yeah. They waved at me with the beckon of their hand, and I stood up, almost on command. Where would you like to go? Have you been here before? A few times, yeah, but I never have enough time to explore every exhibit and its contents. Not all in one day, maybe, if you want to give the same attention to everything. But if you come enough and have enough time, you can become acquainted with it just as everything else. But who has the free time? I have more than enough. We walked past landscapes on waterfronts and in fields, past women naked, covered in dubs and vines and scraped together cloth to hide their shame, past kings with cut throats and queens on her knees with tears gracing the corners of their eyes. If you don't have the time to come often, then what do you do? And why are you here? Even though we passed by pieces I wanted to look at, as soon as they started talking, I felt myself continuing to move, giving only brief glances rather than long ponderings. You want to know about me? No, I want nothing to do with you. That was a joke, love. Is it wrong to want to know my companion in a gallery? No, it isn't. They smiled and continued weaving through the crowd until we reached a long hallway painted in dark blue, openings to all sorts of galleries facilitated guests in and out. They disappeared from my sight. Did they ditch me? What an ass! I turned and left down the hallway, past paintings of men with eyes frozen in fear and sculptures of women on the verge of tears until I stopped. A painting of a peasant woman in tattered clothes and bare feet, staring off at some unknown. In the thick of the brush and the stones of the cottage are three figures, each felt equally haunting to me. Angels in a knight in armour, body dangling as if hanging from the tree. Wait, wait, where are you looking? Oh, there! Well, I see two of them. Don't see the knight. Oh, that one's the knight. Ah, oh, now I see them. Aaron was standing in front of it, next to a woman who looked beautiful. Dark eyes and hair that, despite having unkempt parts, seemed to fit with her ghostly aura. I stood behind, but between them, listening for a moment. Their saints, here to deliver Joan of Arc a message. The one in the armour is Michael the Archangel, who some worshippers call him Saint Michael. He is the protector of the Jewish people. In Christian traditions, he battled Satan. And supposedly, he is the commander of God's army. Though he's kind of a pompous ass, but you didn't hear that from me. 
If I didn't know that, I'd say she was scared of something following her. Angels singing to drag her into the clouds while being haunted by a warrior's corpse. What do you think? She stared straight at the painting with no emotion on her face. You too, Meek? They hadn't even turned around to meet my face and yet they knew it was me. You left me behind. You were just too slow, love. They turned their heads to fully look at me and the woman at their side. Miss, she continued staring, mouth open in what would be a small gasp if any sound came from her. Her hand clutched onto the strap of her purse. It's looking at me. My eyes fixated on the painting again. Joan is looking into the distance, way past the viewer. The angels glance over her form. They're all looking at me, staring into me and making note of every part, scoffing. Her own eyes went wide, eyebrows turned from surprise to concern, starting to descend. The pressure. Aaron took a step away from the woman whose knees began to wobble in weakness. Veins pricked at her eyes with a sickly red. She hadn't blinked this entire time. Tears started forming in her eyes to give them moisture, but that didn't seem like enough to restore their gloss. They grabbed my shoulders and pulled me back and away from her. Let her run her course. What does that mean? Stop looking at me! She screamed at the pitch sharp enough to break glass, sharp as a blade that could cut through the fabric. Even as her whole body shuddered, folding into itself as if it wanted to return to its fetal position, her head was up, staring directly at Joan. I looked around at the rest of the patrons in this hall of the gallery. They all had stopped. Staring without features at the girl, bright clara and dark irises that contrasted against the emptiness of once decorated faces. Even though they should be facing her, I could see each of the eyes growing out of the backs of their heads. Too big for faces, too close for human features. I reached up to feel my cheeks, my nose, my lips, relieved that they were all there. Even so, I couldn't find myself to move. The woman stood up, still focused. She reached into her bag with one hand and pulled out a set of car keys. She leapt at the painting, keys in one hand, scratching at Joan's eyes, hoping to rip the canvas and destroy the work. She was crying still, unable to blink, Sinews in her arm from trying to force her strength into cutting the artwork with her keys. Oh, that's going to be expensive. There was a sound next to me. In Aaron's left hand was a knife, dark and obsidian. The woman heard as well, and her eyes left the painting for the first time and fell on my companion. She screamed louder. You're doing this! I see them! An infinite amount of eyes and yet two never blink at the same time! She jumped out at Aaron, who dodged her move. Instead, she went for me, and I was not fast enough. She slashed across my arm, somehow managing to break into the skin, causing me to bleed. Damn! She threw her bag off her, for mobility, ready to strike again. As I fell back, Aaron narrowed their eyes and threw themselves at her. Tackled to the floor with the other on top of her, she struggled like an injured bird, flailing her arms and her legs, trying to slash any part she could. Then, they all buckled into uncomfortable positions, a leg half up, an arm with its wrist crunched under boots. Her screams nearly broke my eardrums. Until they were gone, 
replaced by gargling and a fresh scent of iron, which was almost putrid. I mean, I get the fact she was attacking, but I feel like murdering her was a little bit overkill. I felt sick as soon as I saw her, a fine line across her neck that oozed liquid like a waterfall. I have to get this suit cleaned again. Everyone stood up, face splattered in blood, their expression turned from sour to sweet as they laid their eyes on me. Sorry, darling. Normally they don't become hostile to others. Though I suppose it's because I'm normally the only conscious one in these situations. They walked over to the painting, holding their hand right in front of the holes that were slashed through the canvas. She must have used all of her strength in this, as if she was in her dying breaths. And with that, Jules Bastien Le Pang's most famous work is ruined. I'll have to fix it. What the hell just happened? I couldn't explain it to you, love. Do you know what it's like having hundreds of eyes on you, tearing you apart from the inside? They reached out to touch my arm. She scratched you. Does it hurt? I looked at my arm. I was bleeding, but it wasn't very much. If anything, it stings. They kneeled down in front of me and grabbed my arm, examining it, whispering an apology for grabbing it so suddenly. I'll deal with this, okay? Everyone's fingers circled around my wound before their form began collecting the blood that had just started to dry. Ew! I tried pulling back, but they grabbed at my other arm, gripped tight around my wrist. Stay still! They raised their blood-covered form to my forehead. A cold sensation brushed my skin as they started painting. Something. A symbol? A letter? But I didn't have time to think about it. I was feeling sleepy. Don't worry, love. Don't worry, love. I'll take care of you. I couldn't feel my limbs, or my eyes, or anything. My eyes were closed, projecting darkness into my vision. The only parts of me that were working were my ears. There was an old record playing in the distance but the lyrics could not be discerned. Voices could, though, and the sounds of wetness, of metal tools, of shuffling and cloths moving with bodies. They've never done that. I was finally able to open my eyes, adjusting to the light. Two figures surrounding a bed, talking amongst themselves. I only recognised one. No, because it's been a very long time since there were two people in the area of effect once the spiral had started. When was the last time? Claude, he wasn't involved, thankfully. You know how absorbed in his craft he was. I don't, because I had more important matters when you were in Italy at the time. You wound me, Genesis. Nevertheless, it was a woman and a man. I don't remember what they were doing there. Maybe they had come just to observe. But the woman was the one who went ballistic, killed her companion before stabbing herself in the throat. Was that the one with the palette knife? Yes, he had left it out, and she, unfortunately, fell into madness and ripped her husband's face apart. Was that canvas ruined as well? Yes, but I was able to repair it. No one ever noticed that it had been slashed apart. Everyone put a hand on the shoulder of the unknown figure and whispered something to them. The stranger nodded back with a concerned look on their face and soon left the room. Everyone took longer, staring at whatever was on the bed before starting to walk off turning their head to look in my direction. I held my breath, if I could hold it any more that I already was. But they did nothing except smile as they walked by. And I had never felt so relieved. I slowly crawled off the bed, 
blankets and sheets underneath and found myself standing. My knees wobbled and I had to grip the bed frame so I would not fall. There were two other beds in the room. One of them was empty. The other, with the spotlight on it, was that bright enough to give the whole room a glow. It had something in it, but it was covered with a sheet. That was enough of a signal to not try and investigate. The room felt sterile. Not in a hospital sterile way, but in the air, it felt like nothing. There was a small bookshelf under a painting between the two beds. Two cabinets side by side, with various objects locked beneath the glass. Under another painting was a desk and a chair, with books and papers scattered atop of it. Did I want to look at anything? Hmm, yes we can, we'll check the bookshelf. What books do you have? The bookshelf was lined with titles I had never heard of. Some of them were homemade books, words scribbled on the spines. On top of it was a stack of papers, music sheets with handwritten notes. It looked like they had been erased and rewritten over and over again. The papers had a strong smell of bourbon to them. Okay, what about the cabinets? I kneeled down to look at the cabinets. One was locked shut, filled with what seemed to be medication. None of them were pill bottles. Rather, they were all glass with labels of tape or paper stuck to the fronts. I didn't recognise any of the pills or liquids. The other was unlocked, filled with bigger jars. I opened it and grabbed the first bottle I found. Ew! If it was not glass, I would have dropped it immediately. Inside was eyeballs or at least they looked like them from close examination they had a glossy finish to them they were also glass but why were these here i put the bottle back and quickly closed the cabinet no more of that what what do you mean no more of that they have eyeballs don't you want to check the other body parts this is like the perfect time to check my search was stopped in its tracks by the sound of footsteps outside I froze in place, eyes to the door, the doorknob, slowly turning. Oh, I didn't think you'd be awake. If you don't mind, let me just... He walked past me and to the papers which was sat on the bookshelf where he was standing earlier. I was going to perform these, but I left them here. Sorry about that, I didn't want to wake you up. Did I? I'd been up for a while. I saw you two talking earlier. That's why they had us leave, huh? Whatever. Is something wrong? Nah. Though he had grabbed what he wanted, his eyes did not leave me, as if I was keeping him in place. So, the papers? You didn't give a good explanation. Or oh, really any explanation, just a shuffle of words. I'm writing a new composition for a band I'm in. More like a one-man group, I guess. I'm going for a deeper effect with my music. I've been stomped on what will make a perfect headbanger. Maybe I'll give you a listen later. Genesis opened the door and looked in both directions before. Ow! He grabbed my wrist and immediately started dragging me out of the room and into the hall. I don't think the two of them will get mad if I give you a little break. There was always a song playing, something drowned out, like a haunted ballroom with no occupants. The hallway felt cold, lifeless. We passed endless doors with the various labels next to them. It reminded me of a hospital with most of its lights out. Artwork seemed to scatter the walls, but it was hard to grasp for their form or subject and how fast I was being hauled. Slow down! Why? You want to see all these boring and finished pieces? Ask everyone about it another time. I got something more interesting for you. There was a curtain in front of us, like a fine velvet bed. Genesis slowed down, bringing us to a slower walk. Sorry, we're still not sure how to properly separate our workspaces. Why are there so many rooms? For supplies and for the bodies. The bodies? 
Genesis pushed the curtain open, motioning me with his hand to enter. Wait, the bodies? Like the woman? They have many pieces being worked on at once. And what isn't the kind of guy to start and finish one thing? Their brain is too scattered. Now come on. I walked to the curtain, holding my breath. Until the hallway I entered changed. Everything about it felt darker. The walls, the lights, and the atmosphere. The air was warm, like fire. Almost, but it wasn't enough to make me sweat. It was just a touch of discomfort. You hold not meek? If I'm honest, not really. I'm confused, I'm tired. And I had a bad feeling that why wasn't making it out alive. That's normal. You've been out for about three days. I stopped walking, mouth agape. Three days? I have to call someone, let them know I'm alright. Where's my personal items? I need my phone. Easy. Genesis grabbed at my shoulder, causing me to turn towards him. He looked almost sympathetic. If I knew where they were, I'd give them to you. But I don't. We'll take you somewhere nicer that isn't full of, um, stuff. I'll ask one of them what's up. Does that sound nice? I'll get you, like, a beverage and stuff, too. You like coffee? Tea? Water? Coffee? Always the coffee. Coffee? You okay with the black? I don't like flavoured coffee. Hazelnut's horrifying. I will agree with you there. I'm not a very much of a nut person. Ooh. But vanilla's nice. Vanilla extract, definitely. I wanted to ask about sugar, but I stopped myself. Him even offering has been more hospitality than I expected. Gotcha, thanks. Before he could continue blabbering, we stopped in front of a door with a sign on it in a language I didn't recognize. The air radiating from the cracks felt cold, at least compared to the rest of the hall. Um, he banged his fist at all four corners of the doorknob before opening it to a completely dark room. Why are you looking at me like that? The how was the banging for? To make sure the hinges aren't busted. He opened the door and waved me inside. Come on in. I stepped into what looked like a sloppy combination of a lax sort of break room meeting a home recording studio. There were posters on all the walls, and right on the table was a cup of coffee. How? Welcome in. You're safe in here. Anyone that comes in, I know where they are, 24-6. Saturdays up the boys, of course. I always invite them over. But I can never get both at once. Try to seduce Erebus. Oh, like, Emmy, you have a good arm. We should play cornhole and drink beer. Sucker socks me in the eye. I think he's in love with me. I have no idea who you're talking about. And I'm not here to talk about this. I'm confused at this whole situation. Who these people are, who you are. And frankly, why the hell I'm not freaking out as much as I normally would? You know, I was thinking the same thing. Dear said something about that, was surprised and called it the other main reason you're here. Take a seat on the couch, relax for a bit. Genesis sat at the desk in the corner for digging in his pockets for his cell phone. Was that a slider's cell phone? Do you want me to just... I slowly walked to the couch across from the main setup and sat down. It was way too comfortable. Sit here while you make a phone call? I'm gonna be quick, just like, I don't know. That's what the drink is for, I guess? How the how did it even get in here? You had asked me five seconds before we entered, and then boom? I'm magic. He went to dialing the number on the slide-out keyboard. I took a sip of my coffee, but I was no longer thirsty after a few sips. When was the last time I had anything to drink anyways? Who are you calling? A roommate. Why don't you just bring him to me? Then, or something? 
Wouldn't it cut down on time? I like annoying him. He waited for whoever was on the other end to pick up. And when he started talking, it was in a mischievous tone, of course, but in a language I didn't recognize. I decided to just look around the room, arranged in a somehow orderly mess. What do I examine? The posters. The walls were covered in posters, though not all of them looked like music. They seemed to be for popular films, games and shows. Is this guy, like, a nerd or something? What are you trying to say, game? None of you have posters of games and movies and stuff, you're a nerd? Are you calling me a nerd? I say as I play video games 24-7. Okay, I'm a nerd. This corner of the room was littered in equipment. Computers, monitors, sound mixers, and even a keyboard in the corner. But there was one object that seemed off. One that sat beside what seemed to be a turntable, out of my field of vision. I reached over to grab it. Huh? It was a small vial of purple liquid that almost seemed to shimmer when it was swirled. There was a label on the glass, but whatever was written on it was long gone by now. I think we should ask about it. What is this? Huh? What's what? Is that them? You told me Meek was up and alive, but you didn't say you brought the human with you. Do you know how dangerous that is? You goddamn. Easy, Abby. He looked like a mischievous cat with the face he was making. Why did they just call me human? Like I was some sort of specimen? Why, you? Calm down, now. Okay. Well, I said that because you're technically a specimen. It is like when humans are exposed to radiation and they have to be quarantined. The ones that aren't overcome by the hunger, at least. Like you can't get irradiated? What kind of weakling succumbs to radiation? The second part is, you're the only human in these confines who can remember their name. That has to be obvious by now, otherwise why would some woman go insane out of nowhere and develop eyes on her body? We covered it because it was, well, gross. I... is that why everyone was staring at us? Partially, yes. I'll explain more when I arrive. You make everything so hard for me, Genesis. Am I not allowed to move your patients around? So, you have to drag your ass all the way down here to see me. Why am I calling Meek a patient? You are so annoying. Well? This is the quick time bar. Ask fleeting questions, avoid obstacles. Oh, wait, be sure to read the options before the timer runs out. Avoiding menu option can sometimes be better than selecting one. Wait, ask about the bottle. I, uh, had something to ask about. Oh, so that's why you interrupted. I held the bottle in front of him by the cap. This doesn't look like yours. It's too... Genesis lowered his hand and stared at the object before shifting his eyes to a random spot in the distance. It's not like I have eyes all over the place. What is it? Emmy. Genesis' tone was serious for once, quiet like an everlasting hum after the playing of a guitar string. You didn't put one of their artifacts in here, did you? Why the how would I do that? I'm not accusing you. I'm just making sure. But this is bad. Why? What's wrong? The two returned talking in a language I didn't know for a few moments before Genesis finally hung up. Sorry if we freaked you out. Eric is gonna come get you and make sure you aren't sick of anything. Is that what this is all about? Why you're so secretive? Kinda, but I also just don't feel like explaining it. I'm bad with my words. We waited around for a few minutes where it was mostly Genesis blabbing his mouth off. 
So like, how tech instruments almost got wiped from existence because of the British. Heavens, I hate those guys. Mighty rude, Genesis. I have a strong dislike for you too now. The door opened. A figure stood in the shadow of the doorway, hands in pocket, confidence in his stance. Genesis hopped up from his seat and clapped his hands together. Oh, it's my best friend, Erubus. My favourite creature alive. Say hi, Emmy. Kill yourself. <laughs> You're so mean. It's good to see you calm down. That wasn't a great first impression on me, Kat. I had important things to finish up before I came. Such as, oh, you know, preparing for the examination and organising books that I might need. It's almost like doing things I enjoy makes me happy. Especially after you taunt me for ten minutes on the phone. Why would I try to taunt you? I just think you need to loosen up. Don't make me stab you again. <clears throat> Apologies. Yeah, sorry, Meek. We had our pleasantries. Can I deal with the situation at hand now? Really? You only just got here. You don't want to, like, a drink or something? I don't want an energy drink that tastes like molten lava. Thank you. You've never had lava. Why would I? I'm not staying. Can I come? No, you're going to bother me. Please. No. Wait, what are you- are you holding a knife? Are you bending a knife point to make Genesis stay here? No. Aruba swiped a pair of scissors from a pocket in his coat and pointed them right at Genesis. Must be, I suppose it's slightly better than a knife. Whoa, Eri. I didn't know you were packing. I'm giving you one last chance to shut up. Oh, what? Wow. You're gonna stab me? Erebus stabbed Genesis, thrusting himself forward and twisting the blade into the other's shoulder blade. Ow! Erebus left the scissors in his skin, as a gift, I suppose. Let's go, Meek. He waved me out into the hallway. I took one last look at Genesis on the floor before leaving quickly with Erebus. The feeling in the hallway was colder now. Is he going to be okay? Unfortunately, he'll be up in ten minutes. But it was funny. So he does have a sense of humour. He just makes me so mad sometimes. Makes me want to scream at him. Gets in the way of what's important. Whatever. You still have that vial? I pulled it out to show him. The liquid swirled like a galaxy of stars and dust. Keep that on you. Why? What's so important about it? It belongs to our less stable friend. Emma? Yes. I can't have it breaking. Otherwise, we'd both be dead. It wasn't theirs originally. It's one of their artifacts. Items from old friends and lovers. I know the original owner, but I don't remember exactly what it does. The previous owner was a sort of expert in drugs and potions for magic purposes. Though I don't remember if that's the one that makes you more susceptible to being manipulated or increases your paranoia. I'm not about to find out. I assume that you've come to the conclusion that all of this is an entirely different reality from the one that you typically perceived. Otherwise, why would my eyes be like this? Why would Genesis be fine after being stabbed in the shoulder? Why would you be walking through random corridors that make no logical sense? Why you got dragged back here in the first place? You do know. You're coming with me, right? You want to examine me, right? That's correct. For what? We stopped in front of a bookshelf. Erebus muttered something to himself before pulling a book off the top shelf. The cover and the spine were empty. Give me a second and I'll tell you. 
Like it was the movies, the bookshelf moved slowly to the side. Though there were no hinges in sight, there was a soft metal screech to the movement. Go on. I took a step through the darkness and slowly came into a light. We entered a library, quiet as any other I had been to. Emmabus stepped in from behind me and circled to a table in the middle of his section. Holy hell! Impressive, isn't it? I've been collecting books for centuries. You've been alive for that long? Even longer. Huh. Emmabus fixated on an object sitting among the books. A bone saw. Emmabus picked it up and examined the blade, running his finger gently along the edge. I'm taking two of your leftovers, since you won't dispose of them yourself. I would have asked you in person, but I didn't see you here. Hope you enjoy the gift. It's never anything normal. It's always something weird. Everyone can't just write a note on a piece of paper or message me. It has to be a note carved into the metal of a bone saw. I don't even know how they did it. What the hell? Erebus closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Chill out. Hi. What the hell is wrong with you guys? Follow me, I suppose. He waved at me again to follow, carrying the saw with him. I'm not just going to leave it here. Erebus opened a door a few strides away from where we were. The door was a dark oak with a green sign on it of an etched butterfly. I followed him inside. It was a small office littered with books. A globe and a lamp sat on the table. An empty space in the back held drawings of insects and plants. Sorry, we'll just have to do it here. You don't even have the tools for a proper examination in an office, do you? Well, no, but this isn't traditional. You know when you read works by Lovecraft about cosmic abominations and horrors? Yes, yes I do. Good to see that you're well read. I do know my horrors, thank you. A theme over here and other stories in that whatever I have seen by the humans was too scary to comprehend because the human imagination is much scarier than whatever an author blatantly describes. Because what also fits within is a human being breaking at just the sight of an eldritch being. Your mind being pulled apart like putty, your bones cracking, your eyes oozing from their sockets until you become nothing but dust. Most demons have some sense of control over their effects. Do you know why I'm a writer, me? Okay, because you're wordy? Because you like to do it? I don't. Do we want to take the rude aspect? Why not? You use too many big words and try to sound sophisticated and menacing. How funny. Each of us have a formal title. I'm a demon of delirium. Normally, that is the disturbance of mental capabilities, which make the person affected feel confused and unaware of their surroundings. But my field is more or less about what's written that can affect you. I'm sure you've read a news article once that made you confused, shocked, or upset. I'm able to make people feel different extreme emotions with my writing. It could be just an extreme sadness after the favourite couple breaks up. Or it could be death or fates that make you wish for death's release. Everyone's mention of leftovers was people affected by my writing in terms of performing it. My words can be like honey, or they can be as sharp as a knife. If I want it to, I can eradicate someone's body depending on how I write. Or I can make someone do whatever I say, turn it into a clay that I can mould. But I have no need for that, other than to experiment and see what I can do. Genesis is obvious. He deals with dissonance. It's why his whole thing is musical performance. 
He can play you a sweet tune or a melody that will rip you apart. Everyone is more complicated. They are the demon of delusion. It's a complex stab of words. But they are also the demon of observation. They have eyes everywhere. And sometimes, without realizing, people are affected by their power without everyone necessarily wanting them to be. That was the case at the gallery. This happens every so often, and it usually ends in the person affected killing themselves. Everyone around them turns faceless, except for eyes, and, under the pressure of being perceived, lash out. And oftentimes, the only person is themselves. But it's been a couple centuries since someone else has been involved that escaped their life. We haven't really known what to do about situations like that. One thing is common about all of the corpses. They become hosts for eyes. They start to form in the intestines, the throat, the heart, and then they sit under the skin. Until they burst through the skin, they don't do anything, really. But they eventually die as the host body decomposes. So I'm here to make sure you don't have that going on inside you. Because they don't even know their capabilities to the fullest. And because this is such a rare occurrence, we only know so many symptoms. I'm not here to dissect you. I'm just here to check a few surface level things. And then we'll see where this goes. Can I ask an honest question? Of course. Am I going to make it out of here alive? He didn't answer for a few moments. Perhaps the hunger doesn't get to us. Are you ready? I don't seem like I have a choice, do I? I mean, if you want to run, you can. But where will you go? I... yeah. Sit on the desk for me. I did, as he said, hopping up onto the desk, nearly sliding across the wood. He was fumbling in a drawer while I did so. Ah, there it is. You mind staring into this light for me? Oh, I can swear again. You want to blind me or something? That's not my job. Ask Aaron. Here's a quick look behind your eyes, Meek. Your lips are chapped. Quiet. Do you want me to help you or not? Don't answer that. For now, close your eyes. I closed them as he said. For a moment, I saw a light through the thin skin of my eyelids, but it was gone in an instant. There's two of them then. I'm going to touch your eyelids, okay? It'll feel strange. I braced myself for impact. I felt a cold touch over my eyes, light as a feather. And even so, aha! I opened my eyes to the bright light, threatening to close them again. Hey. He moved the light out of my face and frowned. That's not supposed to hurt. I'm going to check a few more parts. He checked the back of my throat with the light, his eyes going narrow and he felt along my face, lingering under my eyes and along my cheekbones. But his focus was on my forehead, tracing a few eye-like shapes on the skin. You don't think I'll actually grow a third eye or something, do you? Hush. His hand brushed down my jaw and to the back of my neck. It felt not painful, but more like an unnatural pressure where his fingers hit the nape. It doesn't look good. Judging by the small bump behind her, the pressure on your forehead, and the extra set of eyes I saw behind your current set. Extra what? I think you've caught it. Did she hurt you when she attacked you? I nodded, pointing to the spot on my arm when she had slashed me. This is probably why then. He stepped to the corner and pulled out a more modern cell phone than the one Genesis was using. Can you get Genesis and pull him into the main room for me? I need to share my findings. Huh? Yeah. I just made tea in here. Would you like some, love? No, but do make sure Genesis doesn't make a fool of himself. Erebus hung off and walked back over to me. 
Let's tell the others the news, shall we? He waved me again out of the door. This time it seemed dark. I took a step through. We fell into a cosy room of tables, cubbies and bookshelves. Aaron was sitting on the table enjoying Genesis's talk as they sipped from a mug. The two of them stared directly at us when we arrived. Genesis looked fine despite being stabbed in the shoulder. Even though it was the same jacket, there wasn't an ounce of blood on him. Hello, you two. How are you holding up, Meek? Everything hurts and I want to die. Eric can cure a lot of things, but I don't think he can fix harmful tendencies. I can only help with temporary happiness. I fix the sacrifices, just so you know. I'm sorry for taking two of your leftovers, but it was necessary. Ahem. I hope every over here didn't sing you a sonnet or write you a prose. Guy can't sing for the life of him. This isn't about that to any capacity. This could have gone smoother and faster if you hadn't decided to misplace our human here. And I wonder why that is. It's because you never let me do my job. Listen, Emmy. What was I supposed to do? Sit around and watch poor, poor me sit around, bored? Maybe even being scared when you came in wanting to see if some eldritch abomination was killing them? Something could have happened, you know. You could have killed the human, or Meek could have stumbled into something that would rip someone apart in an instant. You are so irresponsible. I should just kill you. Why don't you, tough guy? You want to charm me with your words? Manipulate me or something? I'll cut your tongue out. You haven't tried that one in a long time. I think I'd enjoy it. Ahem. <laughs> I'm infected with whatever it is. Eyeball disease, parasite. That was a good one. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I've seen and heard some gross stuff. You're all murderers, aren't you? Naturally, we almost have to. What's this have to do with anything, Meek? I want to go home. But you aren't going to let me, are you? No. I don't know it'll affect others if they go as mad as Ivis did. The woman from the gallery. Not that I honestly had much of a plan to do in the first place. You wanted to kill me as well? Want to kill you, Dub? There's something about you that makes me want to sink my teeth into your flesh and find out what's underneath. Ew. Based on the current signs, Meek has about three days left before it overcomes the body. So, what are you going to do now? What do you think? We'll have to kill you, you know, and it won't be pretty. But I'm going to leave that to Aaron. It's a mess they started. Ah, I was going to play you some music. We would have had a wonderful time, man. They stood in front of me, staring, thinking. The two of you are dismissed. Erebus and Genesis both stared daggers into each other before standing and parting in the only two directions I could see. Genesis took the left and Erebus took the right. Well, dear. They reached back into their boot and pulled out a knife, the same black one used in the gallery that felt like a forever ago. I might as well end it here, shouldn't I? Do you have anything else to say? Any last laments? Last please, last... Whatever comes to your heart. Uh, give Aaron the bottle. Running at Genesis' direction. You know what? Give Aaron the bottle. There we go. Wait! I pulled out the bottle that I had nearly forgotten about. The galaxy swirled with as much bigger as ever. Aaron stared at it and lowered their knife, letting it slide down to their leg and into their boot. Their hand hovered over the bottle for a few moments before taking it in their hands. Where did you find this? Genesis had it in his room for some reason. He doesn't know where it came from. They hugged me, head in my neck, breathing softly. 
I don't know what I'd done if I'd lost it. Lost him. Aaron stood up and took a few steps away, wiping themselves off. Would you like to follow me, love? I have a lot to show you. I'm pretty sure I just found the to be continued ending. Delightful! So now do I need to go get killed by each different person? I think I do. Let's go for the deaths. Hmm, okay, so what if we change this? What if we say yes to do we think it's love? Really? Where? In the way he looks at her with soft eyes and a cheery smile. Maybe the cloth they're holding was to be a sort of picnic blanket. Or maybe it was what was covering his chest. He'll be exposed to the cold of the rain. He could catch a cold, but he doesn't want her wet to suffer his creeping illness and from ruining her beauty. She's not focused on him, but her arm is draped over him. She trusts him. Good enough of an answer, I suppose. Am I a romantic? I am. There we go. I'm a hopeless romantic. I can tell in the way you talk and the way your face softens when pondering these things. It's refreshing to see. You're not flirting with me, are you? No. Even if I spontaneously had those feelings, why would I play with you that way the second I met you? I'm just curious about the thoughts of other patrons. Uh, okay, this is all the same. Maybe I've even did ourselves to them. Okay, so like last time we were here, we checked the first door. Once we check the desk now, the book stacked in a line on the desk seemed mostly to be anatomical. One cover shows a skeleton, while another showed half a body of skin and the other half of muscle. There was a book open on the table with a pencil and the pages crease. It was the woman from the gallery sketched with a fine accuracy. The artist nailed her beauty. There was one thing that was off, though. Her face was full of bumps. Did I want to look at anything else? What if we tried to leave? I tried opening the door, but it appeared to be locked. Even though there was a lock on this side of the door, I pushed against it, twisting the knob, and it still would not budge. Huh. Did I... Okay. We've looked at everything else. Well, we'll go back to looking at the cabinets. Okay, so now we'll ask about the supplies. They do a lot of painting, so they need to keep the supplies somewhere. Canvases, paint, brushes. But it's mostly the fabric that needs space. They do sculptures as well. Need to dress up the art pieces somehow. Hide the cuts and wounds. Now, come on. Still want the coffee? Hmm. Okay, what if we investigate the couch? The couch was normal, a soft fabric that felt nice to sink into. There was neutral pattern pillows in the middle. I pushed one of them over to the corner, only to find a small dark red speckle on the fabric. I checked over my skin quickly to make sure I hadn't have a stray cut that I couldn't feel. But I was fine. My fingers brushed over the spot, which was dry. Instinctively, I flinched and stood up. Genesis didn't seem to notice. I looked around the room one more time, while the man was sitting in his chair with a smirk on his face, unfocused, checking for signs of any carnage. Was he good at cleaning, or was Genesis different? Then, I spotted some, a small patch by a closet behind the couch. Okay, quick time bargain. Get checked the closet. I quietly walked over to the back of the closet, staring at the door. There was no smell in the room at all. I had now realized, or in the entire of Genesis' little area, maybe a sense of metal from equipment. That was it. But here, there was a stronger scent of cleaning supplies. I grabbed the knob and turned it slowly as to not make much noise. There was a person, slumped over with his head on the floor, 
arms positioned awkwardly like a poorly articulated doll. His whole position was so unnatural for a corpse, but he was too still, too quiet to be anything but. There was no visible injuries. None. But at his ears, which had dry blood oozing from them and crusting the insides of his ears and his hair. Ew! I didn't mean to make a noise. As soon as I did, Genesis snapped out of his gaze and stared right at me. I'm going to have to call you back. He put the phone on the table and stood up, slowly making his way over to me. Now, what did I dump the last person in the closet for? Probably me being lazy. How weird. But even weirder that you went around snooping in front of me. I, I wouldn't hear. You're good at keeping quiet. But for now, it sounded like a door was locked, even though neither of us moved. I said I'd offer to play you something, didn't I? He grabbed for one of the guitars lined against the wall. You're not going to hop out on a promise, are you, me? Despite it being an electric guitar, he hadn't bothered to plug it into an amp. I looked at the door. It wasn't useless to try. He started playing with a single hum of an electric buzz, even with no electricity involved. Other instruments quickly swooped in, but there was no one else playing. Not a single computer screen in the back was lit up. I found myself frozen in place, staring at his hands, fingers pressing against them, flicking the strings. Sometimes they went to his eyes, which stared back at me just as intently as I liked and stared at him. Aha! I grabbed at my ears to cover them, biting at the inside of my lip. There was a stinging in my head that only grew in intensity with every sound wave, like a virus infecting every nerve in my system. Genesis seemed happy with himself in my pain as I dropped my knees. The pain was growing more intense the longer he played. A pain which fluttered through every bone, muscle and organ until they felt like they were vibrating. One that wraps itself around and chokes out your insides so you're left and able to breathe. I was dry heaving through the song, tears in my eyes while sound waves wriggled through my veins like worms. It was becoming unbearable. Please. Huh? He didn't stop. My fingers were being coated in blood that poured from my ears. Please, make it stop. Is that what you want me? All I could do was nod. I can make the pain go away. And so, he impales me, driving the end of the guitar into my stomach and lifting me up into the air. The music continues and is more painful than the pain in my torso, continuing to gnaw at my senses until they're numb. And then, the music stops. If I could, I would cry tears of joy, but all I could do was feel myself fade into nothingness. He kept his promise, and I had never been so grateful. There we go! I got the Genesis death ending! An adventure 1 of 15. <laughs> That's a lot of deaths I'm going to experience. Okay, so if we just show him the bottle, like how did the bottle in front of him by the cat? I'm going to call you back. No the hell you aren't. He stared, not at me, but past me, eye twitching. Hello, after Genesis. What is this thing? And why are you so freaked out by it? Genesis sighed and took a few deep breaths, trying to focus back into reality. Sorry. It's Aaron's. I don't know how we got here. It's not like it's from anyone new. They don't bring anything out of that when they get an artifact anyways. Unless for some reason they were feeling off and were carrying it around without realising. So, is it like a drug or something? If I'm honest, I don't really know. But it's none of my business. 
You want to do me a favor? I don't think I have a choice, do I? Go find the painter yourself and give it to them. Please. You're scared of your own friend or something? At least I think you're friends. Maybe. If I hear from you again, I hear from you. If I don't, I don't. He walked over to the door and opened it, waving me over with his hand. Off you go. Goodbye, me. I hope you don't die. But... He slammed the door in my face. Ugh. Oh. I looked back at the bottle and swirled it around a few more times. None of this makes any sense. I suppose I should find that curtain again. I wandered through the halls until I found it, or at least what I think was the curtain. The air around this one felt different, colder yet warmer all in the same shiver. I walked through it and... Damn! I crashed onto the floor. I grabbed my head and checking for any bruises before I looked up around me. There was someone on a ladder, grabbing a book off one of the many large shelves which seemed to engulf the room. But he had stopped, slowly turning his head to me. What? The man hopped down from the ladder with his book still in hand. How the hell did you get in here? I... Well... I thought this was going to take me back to where I was. You came from Genesis's area. He put a wrap around our areas without telling me and connected it to a window. Great. Just great. I was wondering where all of my tea bags were going, but I guess he took them. But he doesn't even drink tea. Ugh, don't worry about it, Erebus. You know how he is. You're still on the floor. He grabbed my hand and pulled me up to a standing position. I was going to come meet the two of you and then drag you out before he permanently damaged your hearing. But you came to me by yourself. Why? I showed him the bottle. He told me to give this to Aaron. Oh. Yes, I suppose I understand why he was done playing with you then. What is it? It just looks like some fancy cocktail in a bottle. It's from an old friend of theirs. I am unaware of what it does, but if I remember, the original owner was involved in manipulation magic. I could infer that was one of their concoctions that would give to those who needed their minds pulled by strings. Magic? Of course, Meek. Is it not obvious? The eyes, the weird space you're in, and oh, I don't know, my eyes? Have you ever seen a human with eyes like mine? No, not really. As expected, unless people have started evolving into unpredictable ways. I should probably still give you an examination then, and then take you to see them. But I don't know if it'll be worth it at this point, given you have to give Aaron their little keepsake. Give me my what? I turned around to see the source of the sound. My companion from the art gallery. Oh, me. You're here. I was wondering where you were after you woke up. I saw Genesis took you away, but I don't know what happened after all that. Wait, how did you know I woke up while you were in there? I thought my act of playing dead was perfect. Damn it. Because I see everything, love. And I had just assumed you would make your way over here. I would have waited for you and taken you here myself. But I've been busy. When aren't you? It was an issue in the gallery this time. You never have problems over there. It's this week's sacrifice, love. She's draining a lot faster than I expected. You've been more brutal with them recently, that's why. Wait, I can, I can challenge? You already killed someone in front of me. What the hell are you sacrificing people for? Some sort of demon seance? The two of them stared at me and laughed. Tell me, doll, what did you think you were talking to? You didn't get to see the girl. 
but in her madness over being observed, she herself became an observer. Her body an incubator for perception, eyes littering her corpse, that desperately wanted to escape. But from our studies, they don't. They'll die if their host isn't alive after a few days. So you're telling me that she grew eyes all over her body or something? Do you think I'd lie to you? You know how the Aldrich can turn you inside out just by looking at them? Not every creature knows its capabilities, even after centuries or eons of being alive. You talk a lot. I have a lot to say. I don't think I need you to examine Meek anymore, Erebus. I don't suppose you're going to. With that, Aaron took my hand, entangling our fingers. I realized I ran out of something, which is much more of a priority than cosmic disease. Hey! Soon we were running towards what seemed to be the exit, even though I should have tripped over the wooden floors and stray books. I didn't. And soon, everything faded to black, just for a moment. Ugh, them and their mood swings. We entered a small room with such momentum that I thought I would almost fall. Aaron held my arm through and pulled me upright. Apologies. The room was homey with items displayed all across it in haphazard, yet contained manner. Sketches, notes, and photographs stuck to the walls. It was the first room in all of the ones I had seen that had a window. It looked dark outside, but it wasn't the normal kind of darkness that came with the night. The darkness felt artificial, and the easel was an unfinished painting of... The girl from the gallery? She was looking behind her, hand on her own shoulder. Otherwise, the room was covered in bottles of paint and other substances. Some plants were growing on the ceiling and on the desk, and they all looked to be in good health. You spend a lot of time in here. Not really. I only started using it a few days ago, when the two of you showed up. That sounds like I willingly came here rather than you dragging me here unconscious. I suppose, if you put it like that. They laughed and grabbed for a pallet behind the easel. Feel free to sit. I looked at the stool and hesitated before taking a seat. In her current state, she is unsalvageable. So, I had to paint her instead. You saw the sketches. Did you like them? Your craftsmanship is good. That's a good enough answer. Aren't you an artist? Have you ever worked with oils? No. Oil paint can be very versatile. They rolled up their left sleeve, showing off more cream-colored tattoos that seemed to cover their body. Do you know why it's so dangerous to paint with sometimes? It's the solvents. Normally, turpentine is toxic and more flammable than lots of other painting materials. Though you don't really think of it after a while, the potential dangers of choking on fumes or being set ablaze. Isn't that beautiful? Art which emerges from not just the dangers of the outside world, but also from your bush itself. They muttered a few words to themselves. As they counted the bottle of paint, oranges, yellows, greens, you spoke with surprise at the sacrifice. Ah, alliteration, how nice. What was confusing to you? Do you not make sacrifices for your art? Embedded your art with something that requires more sacrifice? Sacrifice of your time, your body, your mind. And it becomes so great that you need the help of others. The sacrifices which I pick off the street sit in empty rooms giving their lives for the permanence of art. Because a sacrifice always gives something in return, doesn't it? Why am I here? Hmm? Why can't I just go home? Because, you see, Aaron grabs something else from the side table of supplies. It seems that I've run out of red. 
and I have all the red of her cardigan to paint, as well as the blood that dripped down her eyes like rain. And I can tell, just from how your cheeks were drained of colour back in the gallery, that you're full of the prettiest drops of blood. This is a quick time bar, ask bleeding questions, go. Okay. Grab the stool. I slid off the stool and grabbed it by the metal legs. Get the hell away from me. I held it over my head and aimed it. Throw the stool. I tossed the stool at Aaron. Maybe I could get the knife or something else. They ducked easily, allowing it to hit the wall behind them. Damn! I looked down, only to find my ankle with a sharp, clean cut through it. I stumbled to the floor as all feeling and balance in that leg gave way. They crawled on top of me, pinning my other leg with their knee. Aaron licked some of the blood off the palette knife. Ew! That was cute. I raised my arm up to push them away, but they grabbed my wrist, pinning it back down to the floor. Get off me! I raised my other arm. Aaron plunged the knife into my collarbone, making the arm immediately fall to the floor and clatter against the wood. I bit down my lip to snuff out any noises, but I still groaned through the skin. It only hurt so much because you're making it harder for me, dear. Aaron let out a soft sigh, holding the blade of the palette knife under the end of my jawline, slowly tracing it until it pressed lightly at the sensitive skin under my chin. They tilted my head up with metal and smiled. Has anyone ever told you that you were beautiful? I think you'll make the perfect colour for my paint. They pressed into the skin, not enough to do real damage, but just enough to let the blood roll down the knife. Don't you think, love? I couldn't respond before they swiped cleanly across my throat. Everything went black, and I couldn't breathe, blood pooling in my lungs, making a waterfall into my chest. All I heard was laughter, until that faded as well. There we go! We found the air on death. Now, down to Erebus. Okay, so maybe I'll get the Erebus death if I didn't make the comment here. So I would hope you didn't just come to me to lament about your maltreatment of dying people. No, there's two things. Because of the current sacrifice draining so quickly, and it seems I failed to bring one home. Their eyes glanced over to me for a moment. I was wondering if I could use one of your leftovers. Why can't you just use one of Genesis's? He doesn't have any. They're all dead or discarded. I don't have any in feasible condition. Erebus, you shouldn't lie to me. You have two men and a woman whose throats are missing, only able to finish your poems, else their vocal cords completely disintegrate. Each of them would last me a day or so, right? I suppose. You'd let me use one, right? Since you're too much of a coward to kill them yourself, sacrifice them to the greater pursuit of art. I'm not a coward. You can grab one. I'm too busy to deal with them. Thank you, love. What else are you here for? I came to give you this. I had no clue where it came from, but Aaron leaned over to check their boot in one second, and in the next, they were holding a bone saw. I thought you might need it. Most medical examinations don't require you to saw someone's bones off. I know, but I think they should. She hasn't been used in a bit. I've been more hands-on with tearing things apart, and I don't need to use her. I am hoping you can put her to some use. I'll just put it right here. Aaron shoved it into Erebus's hands. I have my own. The two of us stared at the blade for a few moments in awe. In the next, there was no trace of Aaron, as if they vanished with the dust. Well, I was supposed to give them the vial, but the two of them just kept talking. It'll be better to do it afterwards. Follow me, I suppose. Oh 
Okay, I think I found the Oedipus death route. So I needed to do the alternate route so I met Oedipus here with Aaron. But then I needed to not leave with Aaron. And now I think I found it. This is probably why then. It's going to be painful. I should just... He grabbed for the paperweight that was next to me on the desk. It was a glass orb with a snake and stones embedded inside. Do you know how sensitive the temples are, me? There's very thin bone in your skull, and if you hit it, you can hit an artery, and it'll cause near instant death. Doesn't that sound better than suffering? Back off! I tried to hop off the desk, but I stumbled. Erebus grabbed my wrist with his other hand. I'm going to send you off before the perception consumes you. I didn't get to process it. For a second, I felt pain to my head that evaporated as soon as the rupture vibrated through my skin. It was as instant as he said it would be, and maybe I was grateful. Erebus demo ending. There we go. I've been murdered thrice now. Thank you. I appreciate it all. Well, I hope you enjoyed that playthrough of the Art Without Blood demo. This is why I'm not a painter. I don't want to put sacrifices into my art. I don't want to use my own blood. As always, if you want to check out the game, I'll leave the link in the description below. If you enjoyed your time here, then please remember to like this video, subscribe to this channel. Other than that, here is a spooky day, and I'll catch you next time, guys.